Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he lived. Our help is in the name of the Lord. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? has fallen this day in Israel. Prince and a good man has fallen this day. is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. shall they preach except they be sent preach preach the word the instant in season 
and out of season. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the day the Lord has made. rejoice and be glad. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all his saints. Bless the Lord, all his angels. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Preach the gospel to every creature. That believe it and is baptized shall be saved. I waited patiently on the Lord, and He inclined His heart unto me. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. to serve Jesus. It pays every day. Though sometime the path may be drear, you will be happy each step of the way. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. But this is the house of God. And the gate of heaven. Shall I? 
the days of my life.
please remain standing and repeat these words after me. Then the king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a good man has fallen this day in Israel? We shall stand until we have finished the song of the opening hymn, the singing of the opening hymn. I present to you Bishop Timothy Clark. Let us say amen for Dr. A. Russell Orchard. Just before we begin the formal services that will celebrate the life, the labor, and what is now the legacy of this good, godly, and gentle man, would you allow me to say a word on behalf of all of us to Lady Crystal and to Kennedy? to Sandra and Billy, to their children, Kia, Kelly, BJ. It has been an overwhelmingly arduous task to bring together a service that would celebrate his life and honor his wishes. I said to them on Sunday, sitting at the table, Every preacher thought they were Booth's best friend. What a, what a gaping hole is in their ego today. All of us cannot speak. I do want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. A.C. Devon, who is like a father to him. Dr. H. Beecher Hicks, C. Jr., who is here on today. <laughs> Dr. Wallace Smith, Smith the, the pastor of the Shiloh, Shiloh Church, Church, 9th and P in Washington, Washington where, where he, he loved, loved to, to talk, talk about having served. And, and also, one of the, the great, great spirits, spirits whose father was so instrumental Dr. Dr. Carter, would you, you turn, turn to someone and just tell them one thing that Dr. Booth did for you? It may be he led me to Christ. He baptized me. He married me. He encouraged me. Just turn to one person. Tell them one thing. Yes. Thank you. Amen. Just one, just one, just one, just one. Now, you can go back and tell everybody you gave remarks at the service. <laughs> Dr. Albert Campbell from Philadelphia is here where Booth preached so many revivals. So many have gathered. We stand to sing Diadem. If you knew him, he loved Diadem and his great line. And we will sing all verses. <laughs> we will sing every verse, maybe twice.
and the whole church said amen. I know that you've been standing for a rather long time, but Booth had a great reverence for the word. And we all laughed when we were working on this that he did not believe in just the Old and New Testament being read. There must also be the epistle. And so his dear friend, a man he spoke of with such reverence, the Reverend Dr. Amos Brown, historic Third Baptist Church, San Francisco, will come with the Old Testament lesson. His friend of over 50 years, the Reverend Dr. Jesse Wendell Mapson Jr. of the Monumental Baptist Church in Philadelphia will lead us in the hearing of the new and his precious sister in ministry, the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Knight, former professor, pastor, preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, will read the epistle. And then we'll go to our seat as priest the Reverend Dr. Wayne Gordon Thompson, First Institutional Baptist Church, St. Pete, will take us to the throne of grace. From the words of Moses, there is none like unto the God of Jehunoran, who rideth upon the heavens in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee. And shall destroy them. The word of the Lord. For the people of the Lord. Let the church say amen. amen. This is the word of the Lord. Now it happened that as they journeyed on the road, someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Thank God that our friend kept his hand on the plow. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will judge the living and the dead at his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought. The good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, henceforth, now, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. presence my soul takes delight on whom in affliction I call my comfort and song in the night my hope my salvation and my all eternal God our father we come today because you have brought us here brought us all from across the highways and byways and airways, that we might be witnesses of your, the movement of your mighty hand in our midst and lifted from us, your beloved son, your choices of servants, Charles Edward Booth. We come because we have heeded your call that we must come and gather today, that we might lift up your name and remember his service to you in this place called Mount Olivet. And oh God, we remember the words of David who said that the Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted and he saves those whose spirits have been crushed. God, you have crushed us today, but our hearts are in your hands. 
and we say thank you God thank you for this great servant this great proclaimer of the gospel this this great man this this brave hearted man this this servant of God this shepherd of souls this friend to all now in these moments we say thank you again for having given him to every one of us we know him as one who lived to preach and who preached to live and so now we say God thank you for his voice that has saved and led many to Christ but in this day right now we say hold our hearts in your hands now God we thank you one more time for the generosity of his spirit for whatever he had would he give it unto any we thank you because without him many of us would not be here today without him many of us would not be friends without many of us without him many of us would not be here today but because we are here we say thank you one more time now God we must ask you for a couple of things first give us strength in this hour strength to release this your chosen and our beloved into your eternal presence and to your eternal care. Strengthen us that we may cling to the promise that to be absent from the body is to be present with you. Help us cling to the fact that there is a place for us already prepared and that you will come for us like you came for him. Now God we ask you one more thing. Bless my all of it. Make her know that the 41 years you gave him to her, that he prepared them for this hour, and that God, you will lead them forth together, together, God, into their future. Hold them with the fortitude of your presence and power. We decree it in Jesus' name. Now lastly, bless this family. Lady Crystal needs you. Kennedy needs you. Sandra needs you. This family is clinging to you today. May all we do here give you glory, but let it also give strength to their lives. May everything we do here be pleasing in your sight, but may they be lifted through song, through prayer, through word, and through preaching. And then bless this God man who walked with him nigh 40 plus years, who will come and speak from his heart to lift all our hearts together and when he shall have finished because of the power you gave and when he shall have finished because of the strength that you gave and when he shall have finished we shall all join ourselves together and say praise his holy name we praise you right now in the sanctuary we praise you in our grief but we praise you in the promise that all things still work together for good who love them and are called according to your purpose. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh, and all. Sing the refrain. Precious Jesus. All for grace. All for grace. All for to trust. Yeah. More. And 
the church said amen. We stand now for the singing of the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. Ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus hath fled. We sing together this marvelous hymn, How Firm.
Amen. That is how he would have liked it. great loves in life he loved the Lord he loved his family his sainted mother he loved Sandra Billy and their children I will say more about her in a moment but he loved Crystal and Kennedy he loved his friends, but all of us knew he loved Mount Olivet. Now you should celebrate that. He loved Mount Olivet. And up until that young lady swept him off his feet, had you opened his heart, it would have bled Mount Olivet. 428 East on May. I used to tease him that he lived here. I said, you don't need a house. You live in Mount Olivet. <laughs> Representing the Mount Olivet family, Deacon Ralph Gardner III, not just a good deacon, but a good friend to him. A good man. Booth would say, I'm mighty afraid he's a Christian. <laughs> Representing the Gloria S. Friend Christian Academy, a woman he honored. Lady Crystal said she must be on the program. Deaconess Eleanor Young. <laughs> Representing his sons and daughters in ministry, Booth had no biological children, but my God, how many spiritual children he had. His sons and daughters and mentees, the Reverend Dr. Robert Scott of the St. Paul Church in Charlotte. And then a conference that was near and dear to his heart, the Charles E. Booth Preaching Conference, the Reverend Dr. Victor Marco Davis of the Trinity Church will come in that order. Good morning. This is an assignment that I never wanted, but I am honored to do it. And I come today to thank God for the blessing of my pastor, Reverend Dr. Charles Edward Booth. <laughs> Lady Booth and Kennedy, on behalf of Mount Olivet, 
We want to thank you for the wonderful way you loved and you cared for our pastor. Yes, and and how you brought joy to him. Sandra, Billy, Kia, Kelly, and BJ, you are our family. You always have a home here at Mount Oliver. And Sandra, I don't know how you did it, but every time you were needed, you put your cape on and flew to Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> to all the preachers of the Gospels and friends of our pastor, welcome to the celebration of his life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Mount Olivet knows we have been blessed but for 41 <laughs> years with this wonderful man of God, faithful servant, premier preacher of the gospel, exceptional biblical teacher, college professor, community leader, civil rights leader, international evangelist, author, visionary, and preacher of teachers. We know that. And Jeremiah says in 315, then I will give you shepherds after my own heart. And he and they will lead you with knowledge and understanding. Here at Mount Olivet, we know him as pastor and friend. As pastor, he made sure that every Sunday we had a fresh word from God. Ask any disciple at Mount Olivet, and they can tell you about multiple sermons that changed the trajectory of their lives. Some that affected my life was when bad things happened to good people. A faith for our desperation. How to create a monster. Living while dying. My song that will not be silenced. These are some of the few sermons that just touched our hearts. I will never forget him as pastor when my wife Joanne passed. And he sat with my two sons to minister to them after just losing his mother. And he talked to them about how to get over this difficult period. I'll never forget that. And if you took this microphone and handed it to every disciple of Mount Olivet, they could tell you the different things that he has done in their lives to touch their lives. Mount Olive, we come to celebrate. Amen. We come to celebrate the life of Reverend Dr. Charles Edward Booth with thanksgiving and praises on our lips for God, who blessed us with this preacher of God. We will miss our pastor. Yes, it, it, in fact, it's hard to imagine Mount Olive it without Pastor Booth. But God has poured into us his word through his ministry. And we are Christ-centered disciples. So we are determined to serve God. And we are determined to honor the legacy of our pastor, Dr. Charles Edward Booth. God bless you. Good morning, Mount Olivet, to, to the first family, Lady Crystal and Kennedy, to his biological family, Brother Billy and Sandra Baptist, Minister Kelly, Kia, and Billy, and to all preachers and all of you, my sisters and brothers in Christ. 
As I reflect on the work our pastor completed here at Mount Olivet over the last 41 years, the Gloria S. Friend Christian Academy was one that was near and dear to his heart. When pastor arrived in 1978, we soon learned that his passion for our Lord was not limited to developing ministries to enhance and to grow the congregation in the word of God, but it was just as important that we would know our rich heritage as African Americans. In other words, he had a heart for teaching and nurturing young minds to know God, to study hard in school, make good grades in order to fulfill their God-given potentials. Therefore, out of his brilliant mind and his loving heart, he founded the Mount Olivet Christian Academy today known as the Gloria S. Friend Christian Academy. It is an accredited elementary school where students can learn and study academic subjects to prepare themselves to live in an ever-changing world. But listen, these subjects are undergirded by the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Every child in this academy, as well as those who have graduated, can boldly quote the theme of the school, which says, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, at the end of this school year, we give out awards. We have a ceremony at the end for various achievements of the students. And one award is named particularly Pastor Booth Award. Now to get it, one must earn honor roll all year long, have good behavior all year long. The award consists of a day of fun, food, and play at Buster's and Dave's Amusement Game Center. It is paid in full by Pastor Booth. As well as he, our pastor attends it with our children, play the games, and interact with them. So what a, an award the children seek to earn. But today, we have a bigger celebration. Amen. I can imagine, you know our pastor was as neat as a pen. Yeah. So I can imagine when he walked in and he took his little port, report card out of his pocket. Some of us would be fumbling through papers trying to find out, but he had his in his pocket. And every check, I'm a servant, check mark. Loving servant was checked off. Preaching was checked off. Teaching was checked off. Helping was checked off. At the bottom was one big grave that said, well done, well done, well done,
now you see why she had to be on program. Nine years ago, over a meal that Dr. Booth was paying for, he and I discussed um, him hosting a conference that will highlight his passion for the call, gift, anointing, and craft of preaching. He was a little apprehensive, not sure if preachers from around the nation will respond and participate in the conference. He talked about the need for an intimate setting and subject matters that were relevant to preaching. He talked about the need for Christ-centered preaching in a time when everything is being preached but Jesus Christ. His desire was to preach until preaching came back in style. I was concerned about getting dessert, and, um, and I was concerned about his contributions being chronicled and maintained. Bishop Thomas, I did not want his preaching intellectual gift to be taken advantage of while he lived, and certainly not while he rested. Nine years later, the Charles E. Booth Preaching Conference is a reality. Preachers from across the nation have come together the third week in May to sit at the feet of the Prince of Preachers and others whom he respected as informed and inspired. The conference has granted the Charles E. Booth, Booth Scholarships to two seminarians, Minister Tavon Tony, who was here today, who will be graduating from Princeton Theological Seminary in May. And the next recipient, Leaping Minister Alex Roseboro, student at the United Theological Seminary. I'm going to ask if those two young men would stand so that you might see them. Amen. Tavon is in the balcony, Minister Roseboro. Fulfilling his vision and sustaining his legacy, this year we will gather here in Columbus, Ohio, May 14th through the 16th, to revisit the different genres of preaching, as he would want us to do. If you loved Dr. Booth, if he meant anything to you as a pastor friend or preaching minister, if you owed him money, if he took you on a meal, if he was your God, if he was your children's godparent, you can express that by registering and attending this year's conference and making it a success to the glory of God and to his legacy. You can do this by visiting the cebpreachingconference.com right now on your iPhone. In addition to the ninth annual conference being held this year, a portrait of Dr. Charles Edward Booth will be placed in the Hall of Preachers at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial International Chapel on the campus of Morehouse College in Atlanta, GA. In closing, thank you, Unc, for entrusting me with the Charles E. Booth Foundation and Conference. I'll see all the preachers in May. God bless you. To the God of Dr. Charles Edward Booth, to Lady Crystal, to Miss Kennedy, to Miss Sandra, Billy, to Kelly, Kia, and William Jr., to the worship leader of today, Bishop Clark, and to our eulogist, Bishop Thomas, to the pulpit participants, to the Mile of Ed Baptist Church family, to the preachers of the gospel, and to all of you, my father's children. I'm going to ask if the mentees 
the daughters and the sons of Dr. Charles Edward Booth would stand. Thank you. Those of us who are blessed to be connected with Dr. Charles Edward Booth as daughters, sons, or mentees came to this relationship either because of his profound preaching or his pastoral responsibilities. The relationship of calling Dr. Booth mentor or father allowed for us to receive instructions, insights, care and correction, not only about preaching and pastoral matters, but more importantly, life concerns and cares. For many of us, he impacted us in positive ways, way beyond matters of the church. Dr. Booth is gonna be missed. Like many of you, I've called him several times since his departure only to realize he will not answer my call on this side of the veil. With heavy hearts and sorrowful spirits, we gather to mourn, grieve, and give God thanks for the life and legacy of Dr. Booth, how he allowed us to orbit in his orbit, in his sphere, and we were impacted by his personality and preaching. When people say that he was my friend, I quickly, quickly correct them. I say he was my father, and he's going to be missed. As his sons and daughters and mentees and ministry, we ought to have some semblance, some residue of his essence, some of his anointing like Elijah got from Elijah, especially when it comes to pastoring God's people with integrity and preaching the gospel with clarity in a culture that is going to hell in a handbasket, especially in these times where preaching is not taken seriously. Dr. Booth's preaching is timeless, energetic, relevant, and prophetic. In an age where preaching has been reduced to sound bites and tweet clippings and Facebook potings and social media rants, Dr. Charles Booth's preaching rages the spiritual ethos, social standards, prophetic consciousness, and ethical mores of any person who listens or reads his sermons with an intent to follow that man known as the carpenter from Nazareth. With the soul for passion germane to the black church preaching experience coupled with the aristocracy of the mind, Dr. Charles Booth's proclamation of the gospel will be as relevant in 50 years as it is right now. We are fortunate to have sat at his feet and hear the gospel preached live. We're blessed to be called mentors, mentees rather, sons and daughters, as we have called him father. And as we call him father, it reminds me of that man that had two fraternal twins. One's named by life and the other one's name was death. And they were different from each other as night and day. And the father favored life more than he did death. He gave to life a box, a family heirloom. He told life to guard it with his care. And every day when life would come in from the fields of schools, he would look at that family heirloom in that box, play with it, and slide it back under his bed. His brother, Death, was watching him. And one day, Death came in and took that box and went and discarded it. When life returned, looking for the heirloom, the gift, the box of his father, he realized it was gone. And he went and hollered at his daddy, 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 the gift you gave me that was in the box has now been taken. And, and I know my brother got it. He took it from me. And death said, oh, father said, oh, don't sweat it. He said, while death was watching you, I was watching death. And I took the box that death thought he was watching and I switch boxes and death has nothing but an empty box that's all we came to say today is that death really has nothing but an empty box
Mama. Mama. I'm going to ask the preachers of the gospel to stand. That balcony is filled with them. Some of the greatest preaching voices are sitting up in that balcony. <laughs> I salute every one of you. Celebrate all. Look, look around you. Look around you. Look around you. The Reverend Dr. Otis Moss Jr. called his condolences in as to be remembered to this family. We come now, well before I do that, there are enough preachers in here. I'd like to get a committee together so that we can license Deaconess Eleanor Young. Because you should not preach without a license like that. <laughs> now, now, you know, Ralph Douglas West, you know it's something when a deaconess dumps the house. <laughs> Outstanding. Wow. This next section is made up of three people who were as close to Booth as anybody. This first preacher, I owe a debt I'll never be able to pay. When I was pastoring in Warren, he was pastoring in West Virginia. He would come to Warren to preach for the late William Douglas Mosley, and we would hang out. I told him no one else knew it was not yet known that I had been called to Columbus. He said to me, when you go to Columbus, look up Charles Booth. Tell him I sent you. I drove down Main Street to this place for a noon Bible study and introduced myself using his name. And from that day till today, we have been the closest of brothers because of him. I owe my brother for that. The Reverend Dr. James Cornell Perkins, immediate past president of the Progressive Baptist Convention and pastor of the Greater Christ Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan. And then his closest friend in this city. I want to say it again. His closest friend in this city is Bishop Jerome Henry Ross Sr. Anybody that isn't comfortable with that reality, it's just too bad. <laughs> All of us came second after Ross. He will come and speak for all of his friends. And then this beautiful woman, this lovely lady. I wish I could tell you what he's told me about you. Things he said to me, one in particular, that one day I will tell you, it let me know how much he loved you. I said to him one day, he was talking, and I said, I'm hanging up now. He said, why are you hanging up? We're not through. I said, oh, no. We're through. He said, why? I said, my mother told me never talk to strangers. I do not know who you are anymore. <laughs> I am hanging up the phone. You touched him. 
and she will come to pay tribute to her husband, Lady Crystal Booth. Let's receive them in that order. Following the musical selection by Van Oliver. He loved hearing y'all say, he really thought y'all were the best choir in the city. He really did. He really. No, y'all, he really did. He re Where's Willie? He really did. Think y'all were.
Bishop Clark, Bishop Thomas, the Booth family, Mount Olivet Church, the people of God. All of our hearts are saddened today by the loss of God's great prophet, our friend and brother, Dr. Charles Edward Booth. All of Christendom is shaken because God has called one of his special servants and the giant in the gospel from labor to reward. <clears throat> Dr. Booth was a great man and a great friend. As a matter of fact, I thought I would predecease him. Some months ago when I lay sick and lingered down death's door. He stood at my bedside and was there to support my family. 
but most prominent among his sterling attributes is the fact that Dr. Booth was a great preacher. The name Charles Booth and great preaching are synonymous. He was born to be a preacher. He was clear as to why God had sent him into this world, and he never tried to do anything else or to be anything else. His life was anchored in the gospel. As Paul said in one place in him, we live and move and have our being. This is certainly true of Dr. Booth, for the gospel was his holy habitat. Churches all across this globe have been strengthened because of his preaching. Countless souls have been led to Christ and ushered into the kingdom of God by his preaching. Discouraged souls have been inspired and encouraged to keep on keeping on by his preaching. Dr. Booth loved preachers and because of his extraordinary gifts, preachers loved him. When I served as president of the Progressive National Baptist Convention, Dr. Booth was the director of the pastor's division. And it was always filled and overflowing because every preacher wanted to be near to hear and to learn from Dr. Booth. We will miss that trumpet voice. We will miss the fellowship we so enjoy. But we will forever be challenged by his example of excellence and integrity in the pulpit. In our last conversation, his voice was strong. And I asked him, I said, your voice sounds strong. He said, my voice may sound strong, but I'm weak. And his body failed him. And the other morning, the Lord about whom he preached so much came by and delivered him from that body. You ought to have been there to see his spirit climb up out of that body. He climbed on the clouds. He strolled among the stars. He marched along the Milky Way. He glided along the galaxies. And just as soon as his feet struck Zion, the Lord God himself introduced him to heaven. Said to every angel in heaven, this is my beloved son, Charles Booth. He's come up through great tribulation. He fought a good fight. He finished the course. He kept the faith. Be a crown for his head. Put a robe on his back. Sleep on, sweet prince. The angels bear thee to thy rest. Sleep on, sweet prince. We'll see you in the morning. In that great getting up morning, we'll see you again. Hey! 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 Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. We do honor the Spirit of Christ to he who presides, Bishop Thomas. The very first thing I want to say is 
I come to put the devil on notice. That this will not stop our praise. In fact, just join in with me and give God a hand clap of praise. We can praise God because we know where Charles Everett Booth is. <laughs> we have the assurance of God's word that said, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Yea, said the Spirit, <laughs> they rest from their labor. And their works do follow them. Ah, my friend, this relationship was God given. Yes, sir. Say that. I never met him before when he walked into the pastor's conference. And God spoke to me and said, that's your pastor. The first place he preached outside of Mount Olivet was at Tridestone Missionary Baptist Church. We hit it off immediately. And um, they like to refer to us as Mud and Jeff. <laughs> but uh, we called it David and Jonathan. We were as much different as night and day. He was always reserved. And uh, <laughs> not so much. Uh, we shared rooms and could not get along. He wanted it hot and I wanted it cold. We uh, preached together and uh, what an enjoyable experience and I had preaching with my best friend. We uh, had an unconditional friendship. We were accountable to one another, but never judged one another. I trusted this man with my life. He's got secrets. That he's carrying to the grave. Amen. Amen. I, no need you trying to figure out what they were. I'm not about to tell you. But I trusted him with things that I could not trust anyone else with. Never ever heard him. We'd 
except among ourselves. I said Sunday, I love this man as much as a man could love a man and yet remain a man. There is no, no doubt in my mind. Um, we met every Tuesday, called ourselves the Brothers of the Common Life, and God brought that group together. We sat around that table and shared our joys, our sorrows, we could tell each other our hurts. Uh, the city tried to make us more than what we were about. Uh, we really were a study group, but somehow the city wanted us to be a voice for the people. But that's God's assignment. And uh, I thank God for those brothers we lost a brother a few years ago. We called him Dean, Pastor Tommy Turner. And um, that touched us. And we all wondered how we were going to make it. And now we're here again at the loss of another brother but we're gonna make it. Amen. And we're gonna make it because God is on our side. I'm not going to talk anymore because I'm emotional and uh, I'm trying to keep from crying. But I hear God saying, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. And it does not appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. One day, I'm going where Jesus is. <laughs> and one day, I'm going to meet my friend where Jesus is. And until then, <laughs> I say good night. Friend, rest in peace. I'll see you in the morning. Good afternoon. On behalf of the family, we want to thank you for your prayers and calls. Standing before you is extremely difficult, but was one of the requests of my husband. Yes, Charles Booth is still in control. <laughs> he had asked that no matter how hard it would be, he wanted me to provide comments at his celebration at life, so here I stand. My husband gave me detailed instructions. No matter what my services, 
should be at my church. He wanted to ensure that his flock, Mount Olivet members, were included. He didn't want a really long service, and he told me, please, don't drag out the burial date. He said it shouldn't take that long. So here we stand, five days later, after he's joined the angels in heaven. To the members of Mount Olivet, thank you for all that you've done to help him grow as a pastor and as a person. You shared him with the world as he went around the country preaching God's gospel. I also want to thank you for accepting me so openly into the family. He always said, I have a good church with good people. Bishop Thomas, Bishop Clark, Bishop Ross, Pastor Davis, Pastor Fitzgerald, and Marlon, my friend Marlon Gary from the Chapel of Peace. We could not have done these services without your support. I appreciate all that you've done, especially this week. And to our family, Mommy and Billy, you kept us together running the house this week. No one cleans like my mommy and Billy just doing whatever I asked. My nieces and nephews, Kia, Kelly, and BJ, your outpouring of love and just being you is special to me. Sandra. I can't begin to, to tell you how much you've meant to your brother. I thank you for all you've done for him and for me. We are the best tag team ever. Yeah. And to our baby Kennedy, thank you for allowing me to be there to support my husband. You were the apple of his eyes and the joy that you gave him was unmeasurable. He loved you with all of his heart, and I know that you will cherish all that he deposited in, his, in your life. You have quoted me back many things to me, such as mommy, remember Mr. Charles said, take the high road. <laughs> And to all of you, the social media tributes, the calls, the text messages, emails, and news publications are so touching. My husband was really all of that, but it was the personal side of him that was more remarkable. Though we were only married for eight months, our friendship spans over 27 years. No matter what the situation, I could count on his counsel and his no judgment zone. Like he preached, he was able to compartmentalize our relationship. He knew when I was coming to him as pastor versus a personal relationship. Many of you have heard him affectionately call me the warden. But because unlike others, I challenged him to take time out for himself and to more importantly follow his doctor's orders. Preaching and pastoring Mount Olivet was his life, and I pushed him to try new things. He was always a sport and would say, whatever you want. I convinced him to host a summer bash cookout in our backyard. I thought his mouth would fall open when he didn't realize I invited 80 people to our home. <laughs> to see the joy in his eyes as he mingled and socialized was phenomenal. This was the Charles Booth that people had not experienced. I chuckled when he agreed to dress up in 70s attire for a birthday party. I had never seen him laugh and have so much fun. Kennedy and I had a tradition to take holiday pictures. He was reluctant but went along as we picked out our outfits for our annual picture. Kennedy was able to convince him to wear a red velvet blazer. <laughs> Yes, we were able to get him out of his traditional blue, black, or gray. 
We smiled when he got into the swing of things and started asking the photographer to take some additional individual pictures of him. The memories that we made will always remain dear to me. My husband was not a morning person, but miraculously, that changed when we got married. We had family breakfast at 6.30 a.m. every morning. <laughs> yes, you heard me correct. He was up early to eat, but often went back to sleep. <laughs> That was our time to start our day as a family unit. During his final days, he did not call me Crystal. He affectionately just called me wife. As much as I attempted to get him to say Crystal, he just said wife. I thought something was wrong, and he quickly corrected me and said my full government name, followed by wife. <laughs> So I end by saying, husband, thank you for making me the happiest woman in the world. The joy that you have given Kennedy and I will never be forgotten. God bless you all. Wonderful. 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 Bishop Sir Walter Mack comes with the greetings to acknowledge the many cards and telegrams sent. Let's receive Bishop. Can we give the First Lady a hand praise again for her grace? God bless you, Kristen. In October of last year, I was here doing the men's conference and it was late in the evening and Dr. Booth and I, we left the church and we were rushing because Crystal was preparing fried chicken and macaroni and cheese and peach cobbler for us at the house. And we were in a hurry to get there and we got on Interstate 670. And with a piercing look, Dr. Booth looked at me and said, Mac attack, which he affectionately called me. He said, I've lived these years showing people how to live and now I'm going to spend the rest of my life showing them how to die. I didn't know what he meant then, but it makes sense now. And Dr. Mapson, he did die with his hand to the plow. And all week, all over this nation, we've been hurting. and it's painful. But what has helped this family and this church get through this season are the many acts of kindness, words, cards, and resolutions that you have sent from far and near. And I stand today on behalf of the Booth family and on behalf of the Mount Olivet Baptist Church to thank you. Thank you for every flower that you've sprayed this church with. Thank you for every card that you chose to address this occasion with. Thank you for every letter that you chose to write. Thank you for every resolution. And we have resolutions from all over this nation, from every denomination, 
some from the Howard University, Palmer Theological Seminary of Eastern University, the Honorable Elijah Commons, a Cummings from Baltimore, Maryland, the Honorable Joyce Beatty, Congresswoman Blacklick from Ohio, Mayor Andy Githner from Columbus, Ohio, the Columbus Board of Education. We have them from various parts of the world. Thank you for what you've done to lift up the spirit of this family and this church. Thank you for all of the Facebook postings, the text messages and the emails, and even the preaching snippets. Thank you for the words that you put out there on social media. Somebody put out there that we're going to miss Dr. Booth talking to himself while preaching. When he says, preach Charles Booth. So what do we say? And I'll leave you with this. In Dr. Booth's book, Stronger in My Broken Places, he says that there comes a time when life will push you to a place of barrenness. And in that barren place, it's hard to even sense the presence of God. But in that place, you will soon discover that you are never alone. Thank you for reminding this church and this family in this season that they are never alone. As I think of words in which to leave you, I cannot think of words any sweeter than God bless you. Church, say amen. I realize and recognize that some of you will have to go and I see you slipping out. I'm going to ask Minister Willie to just keep playing to give you a moment to do that because once the preacher stands, I don't want anybody walking. So if you have to leave, if you will quietly, reverently do that now. The worship service today is really a chronology of Dr. Booth's life. The one who led us in is one of his dearest and closest friends, Dr. A. Russell Orchard. They were interns together while at Howard under the late Dr. E. L. Harrison. The one who will lead us out, the Reverend Dr. Phineas M. Smith, is his childhood friend. They grew up in Baltimore and sandwiched in between uh, the various intervals of his life. But the eulogist today is his best friend. They have made a pact together that whoever went first would eulogize the other. He has been coming to this mount called Olivet for 41 years preaching in the simultaneous revival. Back when Booth lived on Halleck, we would hang out every night and we would eat nothing cooked by Booth, but we would eat. And one night, Crystal, every week, I would not go over. And inevitably, Booth would call me the next morning and say, and what happened to you last night? And I would say to him, bro, you and Walter have been friends longer than we have. And you need, and he needs, some time with each other. I'll be back tomorrow night. Y'all hang tonight. I always respected the friendship that they have. And I love him with all of my heart. 
following the songbird of the Midwest. <laughs> He loved to hear Lady Ross sing. And no one can rock great as thy faithfulness like Lady Patricia Ross. Following the hymn of preparation, his best friend, Bishop Walter Scott Thomas of the New Psalmist Church will come and keep his promise and send his brother home. Will you do what I did early, early this morning? Will you pray for him? That God will give him strength and give him power. Mother Ross, and then when she shall go to her seat in respect for his office as a prince in the Lord's church, we will stand and receive the eulogist, the Reverend Dr. Walter Scott Thomas, Bishop in the Lord's church. Jesus to the mercy, Jesus to the mercy, and to thy, to thy love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning, 
by morning, by morning, by morning. New mercies, new mercies, new mercies. faithfulness great is say it one more time great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me we've been sitting a while can you turn to somebody and give my hug just keep playing that willy great is great is great is Great is. Morning. By morning. New mercies. All. Oh, I. Had needed thy hand had provided. Great is thy My God, what a sight to. I tell you, Booth would be shouting right now. We have sung everything well. Look at somebody and say, this is high church. As Booth would say, this is the high cockaloria. And it's mighty good in here as we come to say farewell to the earthly remains 
of one of the princes of God's church. I think you ought to give God a hand for the Reverend Doctor. You may go to your seats. I feel specially honored to come and stand in this place today. We have been friends for more years than I care to thank all of my adult life. I have known Charles Booth. I met him through my wife when I joined New Shiloh Baptist Church. And she knew Booth as Booth had been there serving with Dr. Carter. I was introduced to his then young friends, Ava Salaka, the longest tenured one, Jesse Wendell Mapson, sits about Wallace Charles Smith. Everybody had whole names then. <laughs> Levi Benjamin Baldwin. And I was the youngest among these older preachers. <laughs> the reason I'm preaching today is they're older and they wanted to sit and so they they left it to me to stand, but I, I remember, Crystal, those times of traveling up to Lincoln Drive. This was the old Westchester crew. Uh, Wally was at Calvary, Jesse was in Elizabeth, Russell was down in Fredericksburg on route to going to Kentucky. Went to Kentucky, passed at Mount Zion, where everyone in church sang solo. Amen. Those were the days we were all so much younger. We never thought this hour would come. Um, and here it is today. Booth and I made a pact many, many years ago that whoever went first, the other would do the sermon. And then he'd look at me and said, but you know I'm writing yours. And I thought he would be correct. But then the other day, all that changed. And I was stuck in the library of memories with so many albums yet unopened and caused and called to have to share some reflections on a man I've known all of my adult life. There is a word, and I shall not be long for those who look for perfect um, hermeneutics and uh, powerful homiletics. You heard it from Sister Young. You... <laughs> you got the clothes from James Perkins. When he went, hey, hey, I said, it's over now, it's over. I said, let's all pack up and go home. So I shall just describe my friend. And there is a, a word that I think might be helpful. I want to thank my family and um, for coming. Everybody in my house was coming. There was no doubt, no question about it. They all said they would be here as Booth blessed every one of our children. And now they have children. And he's played a hand in blessing some of their children. So they all come to share with us. First Samuel finds us a interesting word and the 20th chapter. I want to thank Tim, um, Ross, um, Victor. They are the Columbus Mafia. In case you don't know it, anybody who's been bumped off lately and you didn't know why. They crossed one of these three. But I want to thank them for their friendship to Charles Booth and what they've done for him here and for Sister Crystal and Kennedy and all the family. You just don't know 
how good it is to have somebody you can count on. Crystal, this is the word the Lord gave me. Booth and I talked all the time. After he got married, I said, we got to build new boundaries. It tickled me when Crystal started talking about early in the morning. I said, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but I, I made a pact. I wasn't calling after a certain hour. The man's married. You got a wife. You don't call after a certain hour. These folks are, but I still call. No, hang up. Call tomorrow. But we always talked about sermons, and one of the passages we discovered some time ago is found today, and I think it's applicable for this hour. First Samuel chapter 20. First Samuel chapter 20, verse 18. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon feast you will be missed because your seat will be empty. You may go to your seats. Tomorrow is the new moon festival you will be missed because your seat will be empty. I just want to encapsulate these words with but one word. Lean over to somebody and just say, missed. That's what I want to talk about. Missed. The text that is before us today, the text that stands for Dr. Booth, allows us to listen in on the conversation between two very close friends. But it is spoken in a season when life is not sweet and when trouble is imminent. Saul has developed an evil spirit and is determined to blot David from the face of the earth. He sees him as a threat, sees him as someone who can stand in the way of the continual lineage of his family. He is determined that this young man of whom the women sang when the crowd goes, Saul has slain his thousands. They break out an antiphonal response and saying, but David, has slain his 10,000. Some folk can't stand it when other people get more praise. Saul is such an individual. And so he has plotted the demise of David. It is clear to David that Saul wants him dead, Jimmy. There is no doubt in his mind that if Saul has his way, his life will be canceled. And so he has run off, he has hidden, he has gotten away because Saul has made it clear David is a marked man. Jonathan, the son of Saul, cannot fully embrace that truth. He cannot believe that that maniacal spirit is actually real in his father and that his father would kill the young man who has only been faithful to him. But you cannot judge a book by its cover. He wants David dead. Saul wants him killed. Jonathan cannot believe it, but David is assured of it. Sandra, the text says, the two of them meet because David has escaped the palace and is determined not to go back unless he is fully convinced that the enmity between he and Saul has been squashed. He lays out before Jonathan a strategy on how to determine if everything will be fine. He shares with him, he says, listen, a holiday is coming up. The feast of the new moon is coming up. And we can plan around that to see if your father really wants me dead. And Jonathan jumps in and says, I just don't believe that's the truth. David says it is. And he finally convinces Jonathan to go along with the plan. And in the midst of their strategy session, they lay out 
what will be the course that they will take and Jonathan begins to speak to David and shares with him what their next move will be he reinforces the plan that David has laid out and he says to him listen David tomorrow is the new moon festival help me somebody and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. David, in the midst of everything going on, the new moon festival is coming up and you won't be in your seat. And I promise you this, nudge somebody and tell them you will be missed. You will be missed. Those words, Ralph, almost leap off the page and do cartwheels in our midst. Those words kind of take us from just David and Jonathan to the one we stand to say farewell to today. It moves us from the historical moment of a strategy plan to escape a maniacal leader to the farewell address of a man we all love deeply and admired sincerely. I need you to find somebody else on that road. Let's look at him and say, missed. Missed, missed. We, we go, we're going to miss the preacher whose voice bellowed out from this church week after week. God, I wish I had a witness in here. We're going to miss the preacher who rocked the house with his powerful and prolific proclamation. We're going to miss the dapper preacher, that tall oak tree that stood behind this desk that marched in this church Sunday morning after Sunday morning. Can I talk about him? In a black three-piece suit with a white shirt and a necktie crisp and a, a tie and a bar and all going down and then having his watch hang in his pocket and the fob hanging from the watch. Somebody better hear me. And his shoes shine to perfection. The crease in the pants just right. As he strolled to the desk in his robe with his bars or his pelleyoon stole over top his cassock to declare that which is the word of God. We gonna miss the man who called airports his second home and restaurants his kitchen. We gonna miss him. Look at somebody and say, we gonna miss him. We're going to miss him. We're going to miss that voice. Hello? Hey, what you doing? When we going to eat? Where you want to go? We're going to miss that voice. We, we're allowed through David's conversation with Jonathan to peek in. Help me somebody. To peek in and get an opportunity to sum up the life of Charles Edward Booth. And how do you sum it up? Do you, do you take him topically? Do you exegete just a passage? Or do you just say, no, he will be missed. I, I got to tell you, there's some folk I'll never miss. God, let me preach this thing right. Oh, come on. Some of y'all sitting in here like bumps on members of the frozen chosen. Lean over to somebody and say, there's some people I won't miss. If I had known Booth was that high on the list, I'd have given God an alternative list. Told him I got at least 20 people you can have tonight. And if you need more, if I have somebody on my street, just wave at me. John, he's going to be Miss. 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 He, Charles Edward. Tomorrow is the new moon festival. And you will be missed because you're Because your, your seat will be, and we ain't putting nobody in it either. 
your seed will be missed. Why is David going to be missed at this table? Carolyn, I think it's clear, you know, David is now the captain of Saul's army. He has brought victory upon victory to the nation of Israel. He, he's the one who slew Goliath when no one else was willing to tackle him. He's the one who's led the armies to battle time after time. David will be missed because when they see him, they see accomplishments. And Charles Booth, it's going to be missed because he didn't walk in your midst and you not see somebody who preached the uncompromised gospel. Charles Booth is going to be missed because he never compromised the gospel. God, I wish I had somebody who could celebrate that preaching man who never compromised the gospel. He was the living embodiment of what Phillips Brooks said that preaching is truth through personality. Yes, sir. Booth would stand up here and he didn't care if you liked it or didn't like it. Can I get a witness in here? Oh, he understood the theology of Niebuhr. He understood the theology of King. He understood the critical response of a preacher to critically critique the culture and the dominant age of Brueggemann. He understood all of that. He understood that the prophet must cry loud and spare not, but he didn't care if you liked it or not. If this was what God said you needed to hear, he was going to preach that word. He'd stand up and the click. Do I have anybody here who ever heard him bring that hammer down on that word? My God, and 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 Jazz, when he met Dr. Proctor. Oh, I just wish I had somebody here. When he met Dr. Proctor and discovered Robert, what the Dr. Pro Proctor would call the dialectic. Oh, Jesus, that you would raise a relevant question. Booth found the hermeneutical tool by which he could dissect the gospel. He didn't care about what other people did. He didn't care what kind of way they approached it. Every time he read a text, he looked for that dialectical tension that existed and he would stand and declare, thus saith the Lord God. Do I have anybody here who knew Prophet Booth who would bring that hammer down on that word? He could come against the city. He could come against the government. He could come against the president. He could come against the mayor. He could have lunch with you and lay you out. He could come against anything. Why? Because he preached the uncompromising word. God Almighty. David should be missed because there are not many folk who preach the uncompromising word. There are a lot of sellouts in the gospel. Because to preach the uncompromising word, the word has to be central. Uh oh, it's gonna get quiet now. But both Booth and I were, were blessed. We were we were mightily blessed to come up under the tutelage of Dr. Harold Carter, who, who who taught us the, the marvel and the mystery of worship. Uh, Booth was on loan from Enon Baptist Church. That was his home church, Enon. Dr. A.J. Payne, his pastor, and A.J. A. J. Payne baptized my mother on a revival in Virginia. So we were linked by the blood of Jesus. But Dr. Carter taught us the mystery of worship. And whenever we would learn, we would learn these high hymns. I grew up a Presbyterian, so I came with my own bag of hymns. Amen. That's why it was easy for me to be Baptist. I could be a little bit of anything. I could come up here and put in these bishop robes. I come from a long tradition. But we learned worship. But one thing you learn about worship. 
Worship is atmospheric. High music, atmospheric. And, and nobody loved it more than Charles Booth. But there was something he loved more than the atmosphere. It's the word. Because the word is attitudinal. Look at somebody say, Booth wants us to go deep. See, we're living in a day and age now when folk just want the atmosphere. Oh, yes. I want to enter the Holy of Holies. I do want to dwell in his presence and enjoy his enrapturing spirit. But the word changes me. The word speaks to me. The word helps me become like him. The word takes away my sin. God, I wish I had a witness. The word delivers me. The word lifts me. The word blesses me. You can shout all you want, but what really matters is not how high you jump, but how straight you walk when you come back down. That's a Buddhism number two. Can I get a witness in here? Booth made the word central. That's why he could preach for an hour and a half. Years ago, when he would preach for me on Sunday, he'd say, you want me to do, all, you want me to do the early service and the later one? I said, no. He said, why? I said, because we do have to get out. <laughs> and Booth, if you stand up to preach, we'll never get out. I remember one time he said, you want me to preach at noon? I said, no. I said, because you only have 25 minutes, and that's your welcome. <laughs> Booth believed the word is what you, you can shout all you want sing, fall out, roll up and down the aisle, but then Booth will tell you, put them on the seat, put them in the bench. The word is going to be preached. Why? Because the word is what changes you. Booth preached an uncompromising gospel that made the word central. Do I have anybody in here who knows how central he made that word? He'll be missed. He'll be missed because he preached an uncompromising gospel with the word central and the reason the word was central is because he was committed to the craft you know I, 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 when Booth and I started preaching in fact Booth was preaching when I, when I met him he was already preaching I wasn't but when we started preaching no No, I was no preacher when I met Charles Edward Booth. In fact, he was riding a Volkswagen. Remember the Volkswagen, Jesse? Didn't you sell it to him? No, <laughs> yeah, Amos sold it to him. That's right. Because he took over the church that Amos had passed. Everybody's connected. But let me get back to where I was. Charles Booth was committed to the craft of, that, that, that's why the word was central. When we started preaching, you, you didn't get much money preaching anywhere. No, no, no. Oh, John, this, we can't pay you. This is just a token. Of our appreciation. And it was not in a long white envelope. It was in a penny envelope. And you knew when you opened it, you might have pennies in there. We, we did not. We did not come along when folk gave you honorariums. Our honorariums were so small, they need not be reported to your wife. Oh, God, I wish I had some of y'all sitting here trying to act like you always got a big check. I, I need some of the 250 people to raise your hand. I'm talking about $2.50. Yeah. Oh, yes. 
God make me dance on that. But there was a commitment to the craft. When, when, when we started preaching, we preached on, we wrote sermons, paper, this size. We got it from Dr. Carter writing on paper, this size. Lord, do I remember that. And of course, every sermon had to be written in fountain pen ink. Why? Some of y'all don't understand. God writes with a fountain pen. Some of you big people and all these little click now. When you get to heaven and you look for your name, it's going to be in fountain pen ink. Robert, we would, we would go to store after store looking for watermans and pelicans and parkers and chafers and duponts. And then we rose up to a Mont Blanc. We, we, we wrote on small paper. Then we graduated to legal pad <laughs> and, and from legal pads to legal pads that had like a notebook that had three holes in it right, 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 right. and then we graduate to scully books and some of y'all don't even know what a scully book is little eight and a half by five book that slipped into a leather binder. Booth has about a thousand of them. Most of us went on to computers. Booth. If he's coming to preach for you, them scully books are in the bag. Graduated the scully books. And many people thought Charles Booth, they said he preaches without notes. You are so wrong. <laughs> there was never a sermon he never wrote out. He would sit and write the most meticulous outlines. Write them and fill them in. I'd call him and say, where you at? I'm on the outline. I said, I'm on the end. We would, he would write the outlines, lengthy out, and then take time to sit down and write that sermon from beginning to end. Because Booth said you want to give God something in the study so that God can take everything that you have and prepare it in that sermon. He was a voracious reader. He read everything he could because he said the more he had in his file cabinet, the more God could bring out and press into the sermon he was writing. God, I wish I had somebody here who understands you don't preach Saturday night specials. You don't preach warmed over pablum. You don't preach the first slice of the plow. You've got to go deep. Charles Booth preached an uncompromising gospel. God knows. Slap five with somebody. I know that's the truth. He could wrestle with a text. He could dig into a text. Why? Because the word was central and he was committed to the craft. But wait a minute. Tomorrow is the new moon festival. And you're, you will be missed because your will be empty. Because David you're a part of this family. You, you married Saul's daughter. They're going to be looking for you at the table. You have shared every major moment. David, you're going to be missed. Booth, you're going to be missed. Because you are not just Booth. You are a part of the family. Not all of it. You know what I'm talking about. 
Charles Booth is not just Pastor Booth. He is a part of your family. When John, when Booth came here, he was 30 years old. 30 years old, 30 years old, had a bush. All of us had hair or black hair, you know. Yes, I had a bush. Yes, I did one time. Yes, I did. He was 30 years old when he came here. He was everybody's son. Francis Pugh's son. Lorraine Smith. Francis Peterson, the Edwards, oh God, I wish I had a witness, the Walkers, Dora Burrell, Beauty Caesar, who said he's a jewelry. You say, Miss Beauty Caesar, how you like your pastor? He's a jewelry. He was everybody's son. 30 year old little guy in the pastor of the church standing tall preaching everybody but he stayed here and became everybody's brother right 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 then everybody's big brother god i wish i had a witness yeah. then 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 he became father to a lot and, and at 72 rest assured uh, 71 rather rest assured you grandfather status he's grandfather to folk there are folk on this choir who I remember were teenagers and youngsters, and now they're grown. Booth's part of the family. Booth would come into town, get off the plane, go to the hospital. Before illness really hit him, let somebody be sick. We did revival. Where are we going, Booth? We're going to get, no, we got to go by Grant. I said, Booth, let me help you. I don't know anybody in Grant. <laughs> we go into the restaurant, but I got, I got to go by here first. Hello, dear heart. How are you? <laughs> Am I right? Hello, dear heart. How are you? And I'm standing there saying, when are we going to eat? <laughs> we got to go by here. I got to go by this funeral home and greet this family. I've, I've got to go over here. I've got to. He was there for your families. He was there for your family. Somebody better hear me. Don't y'all sit up in here and act like all he did was stand behind this desk. He was there. He married your children. He buried your loved ones. He blessed your babies. He came to graduation events. He was there for the little children of the church. He always had a piece of money to put in somebody's hand. Somebody better hear me. He was a part of the family. Not all of it. Look at somebody and say, he my family. He was part of the family to his friends. I need some of his friends to wave at me. Look at somebody and tell me, he was my brother. My God, the friends know he was part of the family. Like I told you, I met him when I was not a preacher. I, I shall never forget what Trisha and I and Daryl and Brenda rode up to his house. I was not a preacher. I, I was recently Baptist. <laughs> I was new to this thing. And we over Booth's house listening to tapes. Because Booth and Jesse Mapson and T. Robert Washington have taped the entirety of history. They have it all. And so we're listening to this tape. Dr. Carter preaching, I think it's the fair to Jerusalem. The, and Booth would say, the Sunday after, Dr. Martin King died. And we're sitting in his basement. I'm new to Baptistism. <laughs> and I'm listening to him preach. And all of a sudden, I hear something go, oh, <laughs> on the tape. And I said, Colonel, I said, what's that? He said, that's Dr. Vaughn, Dr. Alfred Vaughn at Grace Memorial Church. I said, oh, he said, no, that's Dr. Vaughn. He's he now at Grace. He said, um, he was, candid no, he said this, he said, that's Dr. Vaughn. He was candidating for Grace. And I'm recently Baptist. 
I just become Baptist like day for yesterday. So I said, boof. He's candidating for grace. Now, I knew I was saved. I knew I knew Jesus. I said, Baptists have to candidate for grace? I said, in the Presbyterian church, we get grace when we meet Jesus. I said, and you got to holler and scream to get grace? I said, because he sounded like he dying. All I heard was, I said, what does I, my father said, never open your mouth and show folk you stupid. <laughs> so I just kept listening. And he's talking about Vaughn, candidating for grace. And I'm saying, do you get grace in the Baptist church after justification? You got to scream to be justified? Lord. And then all of a sudden he went, Oh, yeah, Vaughn was trying to, Vaughn was candidating for Grace Memorial to be the pastor. I said, and that's what you do to be a pastor? Oof said, no, fool. That's how he was acting with Dr. Carter preaching. <laughs> but I've known him before I knew what Baptists were all about. And all of us up here have a plethora of stories, a moment shared with him and time shared. He's part of the family. He's the one who shows up for the preachers here. Come on, somebody better agree to this. He's the one who calls you when there's a crisis. He's the one who talks you off the cliff sometime. See, Mount Olive, some of the preachers don't want you to know, but they've called Booth late at night sometime. Say, can you just give me a word of advice? If I've got one other than myself, just wave at me. You know you've called him and he's had to help you through and he's a part of your family. But not only is he a part of the family for the friends, he's been a part of his family for his family. There's a memory I have to share. I have to share when it, it seems so strange. You all saw Kia and Kelly and BJ standing at, at the coffin with tears in their eyes. I remember the day Kelly was born. Did Kelly, well, I just wave your hand. Remember when Kelly was born? We were all much younger. <laughs> Kelly was born during the revival at New Psalmist. Booth was preaching. In those days, we started on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Look at somebody and say, thank God them days are gone. Because no matter how good a preacher was, no matter how good a preacher was, by Wednesday, he ain't had nothing new. It just remake of what he'd already preached. But I remember that night in Revival, we'd served communion, and Russell had come over to be with us. And Booth said, Sandra has had the baby. <laughs> and you've got to hear it. Sandra has had the baby. We've got to go. <laughs> now, wait a minute, y'all. It is about 11 o'clock at night. We'd go out, remember Russell? We'd get in the car. we ride to Greater Baltimore Medical Center. My daughter tells me to watch what I say. <laughs> so I must watch what I say. In the 1970s, at late at night, with three long-length John Shaft leather coats on, Am I right, Sandra? I got my bolero hat on my head. Oh, child, we bad as old folks' toenails. We going in there. And we go marching in. And they think it's a mafia hit. But all the years of this family's life, he's been right there with them. Sandra and Billy have almost had uh, uh, another parental support with them. 
always giving help and guidance and advice to the children. He's been there for the family. You can't sit at the table and not miss him. But he's going to be missed by Crystal and Ken Kennedy. He's going to be missed by them. I, now, I want to say this, and I think I have the right to say it. Charles Booth would have been dead if he hadn't married Crystal. Y'all better hear me. He'd have been dead. Twelve months ago this week, Victor, I was looking at my phone and I saw where you hit me and said, it's, go, it's really serious. Might not turn around. Crystal Washington Booth, who, as she said, she had known for years. They, they've been in and out of each other's lives for years. She is the one who put a light in his eye that caused him to change behavior. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. Charles Booth would have preached if he could stand and y'all could have put an echo, uh, a echo, a echo skeleton on him, he'd be preaching. If you could have got a bird to fly him to California, he'd be on that bird. It took Crystal to lovingly speak into him, to teach him how to number his days. And when he'd see Ken, and I, I watched him change his life for his daughter. Yeah. I remember, right. Tim said he was talking to a stranger. I, I remember looking at a photo Crystal sent me, because Booth, Booth was as technological as the lights. <laughs> Booth sent a, Crystal sent a picture of she and him in pajamas yes. at Christmas time. I ate dirt. <laughs> I went straight to the floor. I said, I have seen, I, I called him up. I said, I want you to know, you are fully domesticated now. <laughs> I said, she has you in matching pajamas. I said, if you the elf on the shelf, I'm going out of here. <laughs> he will be. Yes. He'll be missed. Tomorrow is the new moon. And your seat, and you will be missed because you're Seat will be empty. I take my seat on this. We're going to miss him. We're going to miss him. Because Charles Booth, look at somebody say Charles Booth. Charles Booth kept all of us in the fight. We're going to miss him. Because he kept every last one of us Perkins. In the fight. He kept us looking at Booth. You could face tomorrow. Because you kept seeing him win. Somebody better hear me. Crystal, the day he called me back in 2011. And, and special thanks are due. Their names have not yet been called, and I would not let this moment pass without calling their, their names. Dr. Billy Hicks and Dr. Epravara. I, I need you to give them a big hand. Dr. William Hicks and Dr. Epravara. They were his doctors. They were his doctors. They were his doctors. Booth called me in 2011 and said, I'm flying back from the West Coast and I keep getting this cough. I can't, I, I got a cough. And he said, you know, I, I also, 
I'm losing my voice. Well, you know, I'm a certified quack. So I, I said, well, listen, what you do, take two aspirin four times a day, and that'll work on your vocal cords. Just take the two aspirin. I said, that, that's my prescription. I said, well, when you, this, this bronchitis is happening too often. It's hitting you too many times. You need to go see Dr. Hicks and let him really work on you, thinking that he might have something minor. I'm sitting on my back porch reading the book, The Shack, the, the, the Shack. And I'm reading The Shack and phone rings and it's Charles Booth. And Booth says, Walter, and Dr. Hicks says, finally giving me a diagnosis. I've got to go see the throat doctor, but I got a diagnosis on what's going on. I said, what's going on? He said, Dr. Hicks dug down into some number that he saw in my blood work and did some follow-up work on it. And they think I have multiple myeloma. I, I could not speak. I, I just held the phone because I had known so many folk with that disease who had not lived too long. And I tried to muster conversation the best I could. Then I hung up and Googled to find out what I could. And what I read, I called him back. I said, whatever you do, don't go online. I said, if you need to ask a question, ask Dr. Hicks on me. But don't go online. I said, and don't tell folk what you got yet. I said, because everybody will have you dead. And I watched him go through treatment after treatment. The, the lifespan on that disease is sometimes about four years, four and a half years. 2011, he's diagnosed. And I watched him win. Time after time. I watched him win battle after battle. I watched him win the nerve endings of his feet. The nerves in his feet almost lost the sheath over the nerve ending and he had non-stop pain right. shooting through his right. feet and ankles. So the day he died, walking, you'd see him sometimes walk gingerly because the pain was so great. But I'd watch him when I'd see him stand sometimes having to go to the hospital and get platelets before going to a revival and then going to get a transfusion. But I'd see him stand and preach the unwavering gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I wish I had somebody. I'd watch him win. I'd see him down as low as a footprint. He'd be down so low. And it looked like I said, Booth, how you doing? I, I, I don't know. I'm just tired. I'm just weary. I'm just worn out. But I'd see him stand on Sunday morning when I dial into the Mount Olivet Baptist Church. And there he was coming to the desk. Do I have anybody here who understands what it means to watch somebody win? To watch somebody come back from one thing after another? another thing after another thing I, wait a minute I'm almost finished y'all sit down just give me just one I gotta add this last April last April it looked like it was over it I was sitting in a banquet for my fraternity phone rang Victor said we are taking him straight to the hospital he said it's not good Crystal's on her way, riding up the road. And I'm thinking to myself, she's got to ride with all of this going through her head. We get to the hospital and Booth has a mask on and he's not well. He's got problems with his lungs. They cannot determine everything that is wrong with him. And we are beginning to look like, oh my God, is he that close to the banks of joy? Somebody better hear me. It looks like it is going to be rougher than we can imagine. And to add insult to injury, his friend Jerome Ross then falls and fractures his neck. The chief prayer warrior of the group. Now I can pray. Tim can pray a little bit. Victor can pray some. I mean, but don't none of us. And Wayne going to cry. Y'all just will hear the truth. 
The other week I called, I said, how's everybody doing? He said, well, you know, Ross is just making it. Booth's in the hospital. They took me last night. I, Victor said they took me. I had to go yesterday. I said, gosh, the whole team almost off the field. Then I called him two days later. I said, Victor, man down. I'm off the field. We can't even suit up to get on the field. But Ross is the chief prayer warrior for all of us. And Ross has a cone around his neck, look like he's from Mars. Am I right, Pat? He got this thing going around his neck. Like he receiving radio waves. I said, my God, Booth in one hospital, Ross in Florida in another hospital, and it's looking as bad as it can. There was no way Crystal came in and never had a negative word for this. He will recover. He will get well. Am I right? She spoke it, believed it, and little by little we watched him rise back up until one Sunday morning he came in Mount Olivet Church and preached again with power. He kept on winning. But I close with this. The other, other, other Saturday, Crystal called me and I could hear in her voice that she knew the end was not far. It was so unusual because she was always the bearer of the colors as he went into battle. But this time she sensed there was a higher thing happening. I talked with him, came to see him that Monday and he looked well and looked good and strong. And I thought to myself, he will rise up one more time. His seat will not be, will not be empty. Later that evening, Sandra and Crystal called and said things were turning a different direction. And little by little, the rest of the week, and by Wednesday, Crystal called and said they'd given me an option. And I knew in her voice, she knew what that meant. And when I hung up the phone, and all the way up till yesterday, I kept saying to myself, but we saw him win. We kept seeing him win. Couldn't we see him win? One more time. Couldn't we see him win? Just, just one more time. And I was sitting in the hotel room and the memories that have been flooding in, in the library of all of our experiences. I remember a book the two of us read together, because we read books together. It's entitled Pilgrim's Progress. And there was an interesting story in Pilgrim's Progress once Pilgrim comes through the gate and the burdens of life finally roll off his shoulder. He is sent to the home of a man named Evangelist, or rather Interpreter. He is sent to Interpreter's house. And when he goes to Interpreter's house, Interpreter shows him a variety of scenes. But then he carries him to one scene, Trisha. And he shows him a man standing beside a fire that's up against the wall that's blazing hot. And he sees a man throwing water on the fire. But the fire keeps getting hot. And Christian does not understand what he is seeing. An interpreter says, come with me around the back of the flame. And Jasmine, he walks him around to the back of the flame. And he sees another man with a vial of oil in his hand, throwing oil on the fire. He says, that man you see in the front is the devil who's trying to pour water on the grace of God in every man's life. But the man behind the scenes is throwing oil on that grace. 
so that what looks like a defeat is really a real victory. And I started thinking to myself, we thought Booth lost the other day. We thought Booth lost the other day. But I stopped in here to tell you he didn't lose. There's a man on the other side who was waiting for him Saturday night who picked him up and took him home. You know, when I was growing up, I used to hear old preachers talk about heaven. But you know, we don't talk about heaven much anymore in our preaching. We try to keep it relevant and try to keep it in time. But you can't come to Charles Booth's funeral and see a man who won and you think he lost the other Saturday without realizing he really won the prize. Oh, yes, he did. I can see him. Perkins, you saw him dancing across the stars. I see him walking around saying, I made it. I made it. I see him going by Bill Jones and walking over to Hell Carter and then slipping by the, uh, J, all the preachers who passed before him. I see him finding Gardner Taylor. I, I see him walking up to our old man Pilgrim and I see him going over to old man Cleveland and I see him saying, thank you, Lord. I fought a good fight. I ran my race and I have kept the faith. I'm taking my seat on this, but grab somebody and just tell him he's missed. Oh, y'all didn't say it like you mean it. Look at somebody say he's missed. But I know where he is and I know where to find him. And one of these mornings in the sweet by and by, oh, but church, he can't crown him till we get there. And when we all get to heaven, reach out and hold somebody's hand. There's my seat on these words. I've sung my song. I've done some good. I've done some wrong. And I shall go where I belong. The Lord has willed it so. He knows my heart and every thought. He knows what pain and joy I brought and by his love I shall be taught the way to him I know father as those words were sung over his mentor Dr. J. Pius Baba now these words are spoken on his behalf welcome in Charles Edward Booth, preacher of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Come on, give God praise. I need that you would do something for Dr. Booth, and that is to not dishonor his memory by a disruptive end to these services. We were scheduled to be at the cemetery at 2 o'clock. It is now 2.01, which means we must expeditiously make our way to Union. I'm going to ask those in the folded seats on the aisle. The ushers are coming now. The preachers who are going to the cemetery, would you please resist the temptation to talk to one another? We've got to get to this cemetery. And if we're waiting on you, it's going to hold us up. So if you go to your cars, turn your lights on so we'll know how to flag you and we can quickly line up the processional. I'm only talking to give them time to clear the middle aisle. 
We thank God for Bishop Walter Scott Thomas. I'm going to ask the active pallbearers to come to my left, your right, so that the staff of Marlon Gary Funeral Services will know how to take care of you. I believe the deaconess are the flower bearers. Is that right? I need everyone else now to stay in your place. The benediction will be given at the cemetery. The recessional will be led by Booth's lifelong friend, the Reverend Dr. Phineas M. Smith. All right, Doc. All right. We're going to get you out of here. You can leave. Does he have a mic? If I take this handheld, I'm talking to the brother. Can you still pick him up as he walks to lead us out on this mic so that he can be heard? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. You're going to take this one, Doc, and you'll lead us out. We want you to go out with us. We'll get the benediction into cemetery. No, you go first. You and I walk out. sitteth in the seat of the scornful, for his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree 
planted, planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sin gate of the right. Why?
tell a story. I'm gonna tell the story. I'm gonna say how the Lord is real and loved one who's gone on before me. Shake hands with my mother. Most of all, see Jesus, the man who died for me.